Good afternoon. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you with the, the heart healthy meal of the day uh, to Dr. Uh, William Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts is currently the medical director of the Baylor Heart and Vascular Center in Dallas, Texas. Uh, previously, he became really one of the world's renowned pathologists while at the National Institute of Health. For those of us who've been around a long time, uh, he was responsible for Bruce McManus and Bruce's training in uh, cardiac pathology. Uh, he also worked and trained one of my uh, friends and mentors at Indiana, Dr. Bruce Waller. Uh, there's something else about Dr. Roberts that allows me to introduce him. Uh, in 1985, I submitted a manuscript to him, and he was kind enough to accept it uh, as a lead article and as my first real science. If he'd turned it down, it might be a much shorter Grand Rounds today. But uh, he is also editor of the American Journal of Cardiology, and I think really one of the outstanding figures in uh, cardiovascular disease. I suspect he's uh, done more studies on coronary artery disease and pathology than anyone else around. Is that a fair statement, Stan? And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roberts, who's going to have a very interactive and entertaining uh, presentation for you. Let's all welcome in. Thank you. Is this on? Yep. yep. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Wendell, for those uh, very gracious comments. I noticed you didn't, you didn't get an answer to your question, uh, but uh, no, no, uh, I'm not offended by that. Uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm glad it's uh, September and not January, however. Um, wonderful place. Uh, Y'all have these questions? Question one, of the various atherosclerotic risk factors, which one is an absolute prerequisite for development of atherosclerotic plaques? Well, let me proceed that by uh, just a listing of the uh, various atherosclerotic risk factors. Why don't you all shout them out and I'll put them up here. Anybody? Diabetes. Diabetes mellitus. I, I, that's an endocrinologist speaking now. <laughs> <laughs> well, corticosteroids, you may have some there. Okay, high blood pressure, systemic hypertension. Lipids. Ooh. Okay. Cigarette smoke. Obesity. Okay, abdominal obesity. Age. Age. Genetics. Genetics. What? Okay, postmenopausal status. Anything else? Gender. Gender. Male or female? Both. <laughs> okay, male. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, now the question does not ask to list the atherosclerotic risk factors, but of these uh, 10, which you have named, which one is an absolute prerequisite for development of atherosclerotic plaque? Okay, do you have to have diabetes to have atherosclerotic plaque? No, so it's an indirect factor. Do you have to have high blood pressure to have atherosclerosis? No, so it's an indirect factor. Um, do you have to have hyperuricemia? <laughs> usually this one, the old blue, usually this one comes down here. So it makes it easier. Okay, so the answer is no. Do you have to be a cigarette smoker? No. Do you have to be obese? No. Do you have to have an age? Yes. Um, uh, after it takes, it simply takes time uh, to form enough plaques uh, to cause luminal narrowing. Uh, if we have an artery, 
and we take a cross section of it, we have to obliterate uh, at least three of the four quadrants, that is in cross-sectional area, before there is organ ischemia or infarction. So it simply takes time to build that much plaque. Uh, so age is important. Uh, we don't have it at, at birth. Uh, genetics, how important are genetics? Um, it depends uh, how that's defined. Um, uh, I live in Dallas, Texas, and we have Brown and Goldstein there. And I like their definition of the familial or genetic variety, and they define it by LDL receptors in the liver. And most of us have 100% LDL receptors in the liver, and in this country, over age 20, uh, we average total cholesterols now about 210, and uh, we die about 75 or so, male and female. And then there are a few people, and this turns out to be about 499 out of 500 people. And then, um, sorry about that. Um, and then there are a few people with only half LDL receptors in the liver. And they have total cholesterols of about 300 or so, and they die about age 50. And this apparently is about one in 500. And then there are a few people, fortunately only one out of a million, uh, who have no LDL receptors in the liver. And they have total cholesterols usually greater than 800, and they die about age 10. So if you look at it purely from that aspect, uh, we're talking about one in 500 people. Uh, maybe there are a couple other very uncommon genetic forms. Uh, but my own view is we're talking about, from a genetic standpoint, about one out of 400 people. The rest of us, um, we have something like uh, uh, 6.1 billion people on planet Earth. As I understand it, about 1.5 billion develop enough plaque to have a problem, or potentially have a problem. That leaves 4.6 billion that don't. Uh, I think these people and these people are the, genetically the same. Uh, the difference is these people have money, and these people don't. And you have to have money to buy cows and pigs and sheep and goats. And and that kind of thing. So I think most families eat the same food. So how important is genetics? Uh, I, don't, I think atherosclerosis is not a Presbyterian disease. Uh, Postmenopausal state, uh, I think that comes, uh, comes uh, uh, also with lipids. Uh, after menopause, uh, LDL, uh, total cholesterol, so suddenly higher in women uh, than men. Maybe estrogen there uh, is important, but it looks like it hadn't worked out so well uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint. Now men, the last couple of years as I understand it, more women have died in this nation from atherosclerotic disease than did uh, men. Uh, ladies, you have about one in two chances of developing cardiovascular disease or dying from it, and you have about one in eight chances of dying from cancer of the breast. So this is not a disease uh, uh, limited uh, to men. Number two, what serum cholesterol numbers are required to shift from decreasing risk of atherosclerotic events to actually preventing and arresting the atherosclerotic process? In other words, if I walked into your office uh, and said, Doctor, what cholesterol numbers do I have to have so that I don't form plaques in my arteries? And what would you tell me? Hello? Anybody? Yeah, I, I think that, I think we have to have a total cholesterol less than 150, an LDL, usually about two thirds of that. Uh, less than 100. And I say we have to have an HDL greater than 20. 
And he said, oh, well, everybody knows that HDL 20 or 21 or 25 is low. But if your total cholesterol is 130, HDL of 21, I think, is okay. If your total is 190, HDL 21, you've got a major problem. Uh, Donald Fredrickson, when I was at NIH, had a patient with a total cholesterol of, uh, of 70. And uh, he, he died at age 72 and had a bypass operation at age 60. His HDL was 1. <laughs> Ratio was 70. Had no HDL. Uh, so that's why I put in this caveat right there. But when we're born, our total cholesterol, as I understand it, in umbilical blood is about 75. Our LDL is 50. Uh, those tend to double in about a month. Our blood pressure at birth is 90 over 60. And in societies who eat no salt, it stays 90 over 60 a lot. So maybe we ought to push this further down. There's some people who believe we ought to have an LDL of 60, an HDL of 60, and a triglyceride of 60. Do we have to decide whether we want plaques or whether we don't? Well, the guidelines talk about decreasing risk. I'm talking about preventing and arresting the process. Pediatricians don't talk in terms, I don't think, well, let's decrease the risk of measles, mumps, and whooping cough, and polio. They say, let's prevent it. Here we're dealing with a disease that's genetic and maybe one out of 400 people. Okay, uh, number three. What average reductions in serum toll and LDL cholesterol can be expected by decreasing the percent of calories from fat from 40% to 30% to 20% to 10%? In other words, here we, here we are, and let's say we have a population that's taking in 40% of calories from fat. And that's what we want to know about any food, percent of calories from fat not the percent by weight. Whole milk is 4.5% fat by weight. It's 87% water. But whole milk is 50% of calories from fat. So the question on the table, if we reduce that from 40% to 30% of calories from fat, the most commonly prescribed diet by physicians <coughs> in this nation, a 25% reduction what reduction do we get in total cholesterol and LDL on the average? Now, everybody's a little variable, of course. But what's the average reduction in these by that 25% reduction? Anybody? Yeah. Well, the hunting hack study uh, showed a 5% reduction. That was the average. So that means going from about 200 total cholesterol to 190. In an individual patient, it wouldn't help too much. Population, it'd help a great deal. It seems to me we have to be down here about 20% of calories from fat, and then we get roughly a 20% reduction, which would mean going from 200 to 160. But that's very hard to do in our environs. The vegetarians are down here at about 10%. And then we wouldn't need all these drugs. Dean Ornish is down here at 6%. You have to go to his shop to pick up the food to get that low. OK, uh, number four. What average reductions in serum toll and LDL cholesterol can be expected from the FDA-approved doses of the presently available, now five statin drugs, of course, and what is meant by the rule of five and the rule of seven? Anybody know the rule of five and the rule of seven? Well, maybe we ought to talk about it then. Um, okay, if, if we look at the, at the various drugs, Baycol or uh, cerubostatin is gone now. We have uh, Lipitor or Torvastatin at, uh, at five. Uh, this was 0.2. Then we have uh, uh, Zocor or Simvastatin at 10. That's a two-to-one relationship. Then we have uh, 
Provacor or Lovastatin at 20, Provacol, Provastatin at 20, and uh, Lescol or Fluvastatin at 40. Those are the equivalent doses. So there are, is a difference in potency in these various drugs. So you just adjust for efficacy. Now, what is the average reduction in total cholesterol? And that is 22%. The average reduction in LDL is 27%. And the liver enzyme increase greater three times the upper limit of normal is 0 0.25, which is one out of 400 people, which is the same as placebo. Okay, uh, now we're at Torvastatin 10. That's their smallest tablet. Simvastatin at 20. Lovastatin at 40. Uh, Provastatin at 40. Fluvastatin at 80. And this is where the rule of five comes in. And this is where the rule of seven comes in. And what that means, of course, is that every time these doses are doubled, we get a 5% additional reduction in total and a 7% additional reduction in LDL. And liver enzyme increase is doubled. So 0.5 means one out of 200 people. And then we go to 20 of a Torvastatin, 40 Simvastatin, 80 Lovastatin. These are not approved. Now we're at 32% reduction in total, 41% reduction in LDL, and that's 1%. And we go to 40 of a Torvastatin, 80 of Simvastatin. These are not approved, 37% reduction in total. 48% reduction, 2% liver enzyme elevation, and then we have 80 of uh, torvastatin. These are not approved. 42% reduction in total, 55% reduction in LDL, and that's about 2.5%. Folks, this is an absolute miracle. Look at that. <coughs> reduction of over 50% in LDL. Um, there are a couple of things that are different uh, about these. Uh, I, until the Baikal catastrophe, I didn't think there was much difference in these statin drugs. Uh, there are clearly a difference in potency. There's difference in chemical formula. Um, there is some difference, uh, surprisingly, in LDL reduction. Uh, at these lower doses, the average increase in HDL is about 6 or 7 percent, and that's across the board. Uh, there is some difference in atorvastatin and simvastatin in HDL at the higher doses, um, and that is uh, a 20 of a torvastatin continues to give about a 7% increase in, in HDL, and at 40, it's, it's about 1% or uh, no change. 40 here, it increases it maybe 13%. This at 80, maybe 17%. There, there are some differences here uh, at the higher doses. Why that is, uh, nobody, nobody knows for sure. Now, in my view, all of these statin drugs are miracle drugs. Uh, you can't give all of them to the same patient, of course, so we have to decide which ones uh, when. Um, but I think the statin drugs are to atherosclerosis what penicillin was to infectious disease. Now, when penicillin came out, everybody in the world knew immediately, lay public and physician, medical people, uh, knew immediately it was a miracle drug. This is another miracle drug. I think no drug has been introduced in cardiovascular disease that approaches the potential benefit uh, of this drug. And I have no stocks in any pharmaceutical companies, none. Okay, uh, rule of five, rule of seven. So if you know those initial doses, it's easy to calculate. Now in my view, in my view, uh, the reason so, Few people 
are at goal, whether you use the guidelines or my goal, which is an LDL uh, less than 100 for everybody. Throughout America, we've got to decide, do we want to decrease risk or do we want to prevent the process? It's as simple as that. Now, we can't afford that. These drugs cost money. Well, um, we can continue doing 900,000 coronary angioplasties a year. Or we can continue doing 500,000 bypass operations. One of my boys is a cardiovascular surgeon. I hate to tell him, but I'd like to put him out of business. I, do we? These things are very expensive. Uh, these drugs, uh, comparatively, are not. Uh, these drugs, incidentally, uh, when you buy a statin drug for yourself, you're, you're buying health insurance. For you, when you buy life insurance, you're buying it for others, your family. That's death insurance. <laughs> this, this is life insurance. Uh, okay, uh, number five, are there differences in statin drugs? We've clearly shown potency is different, chemical formula is different, price is different, and how should price be evaluated? Well, in my view, by price should be evaluated by percent LDL decrease per penny. Now there's some of the uh, drugs that uh, are less than others, but their LDL reduction is not nearly as, uh, as much uh, per cost. Okay, number six. Uh, number six is important, I think. What's the correlation between percent LDL reduction using a statin drug, and percent reduction in coronary events at five years. If you look at the five trials with statins, of five-year trials, and these five-year trials used uh, uh, simvastatin, pravastatin, and lovastatin. Uh, these are double-blind, placebo-controlled. You can't do a five-year placebo-controlled trial anymore. It's, it's, it's uh, essentially malpractice. But one of the things shown in these trials was that whatever percent decrease you got in LDL, let's say in the 4S study, you got a 35% reduction in LDL. And that was the most powerful reduction. Uh, only one of the five trials got an LDL on an average less than 100. And that was the one that started with the lowest LDL. Now, what, whatever reduction you get, and all five trials essentially showed the same thing, whatever reduction you get in LDL, that's the relative risk reduction in five years. Uh, so if the LDL decrease was 35%, the relative risk reduction was 35%. Now, what is relative risk? If you have um, uh, the control group, and the frequency of atherosclerotic events in five years was 20%. And the uh, treatment group, the percent events in five years was 15%. The relative risk reduction was a decrease of 25%. That's relative risk. This is absolute risk. Uh, but the point of this, and now, we know we can decrease LDL by 50%. And uh, maybe next year, uh, Merck and Shering Plow are coming out with a drug, um, a combination of simvastatin plus azitamib, 10 milligrams of each. That will decrease LDL 52%. And if you increase that simvastatin to 80, it decreases LDL 65. Uh, there's another statin coming out next year also, I understand. Uh, so this is getting to be a very powerful uh, a ball game. Now when you're sitting, when you have that one patient sitting across from your desk and you can tell them, now look, you've just had a heart attack or you have diabetes. And you take this drug and the dose I'm telling you about, um, we can, we can uh, uh, 
tell you pretty reliably that your chance of having another heart attack in the next five years is decreased 50%. In other words, we've got to sell these people to keep taking the drug. Half the people put on a statin drug quit taking it in a year. Half the people. Um, uh, relatively few people actually reach goal. Only 20, 25% of people who've had heart attacks in this nation put on a statin drug, uh, get LDL uh, to less than 100. The biggest reason is that the dose is too small. So in my view, I think, I believe in giving the dose from the beginning that does the job. If, for example, let's say you have somebody with an LDL of 148. If you want to get that LDL to 100, a little under, you got to go right here, 34 percent reduction. That'll give you about 100. So we're talking about uh, atorvastatin 10, semvastatin 20, lovastatin 40, that's expensive, pravastatin 40. The dose that does the job from the beginning. Most people do not have the dose raised. Okay, uh, number seven, what is meant by baseline dependent? and non-baseline dependent regarding lowering of the total and LDL cholesterol and triglycerides by statin drugs. Well, uh, let's say non-baseline dependent. Uh, non, uh, total, total cholesterol and LDL are non-baseline dependent. That means whatever the total, let's take LDL, whatever the original LDL is, whether it's 90, and you put them on a statin drug, which uh, lowers uh, the LDL, let's say 34%. Uh, we're talking about bringing that down to about uh, uh, 130, something like that. Uh, if your LDL is 130 and you put them on the same dose of statin, which would lower it 34%, we're talking about getting that thing down to uh, 90 or 85, something like that. You get the same percent reduction irrespective of what the baseline number is. And that's for LDL and total. Triglyceride is baseline dependent. In other words, if you have a triglyceride level of 80 and you put them on a statin drug, it's still 80. Doesn't change. I didn't do that very well, did I? Doesn't change. Now, if you have a triglyceride of 300 and you put them on a statin drug and some doses have the capacity of lowering that by 40%, we're talking about uh, down to 170. So triglycerides are baseline. Dependent. Number eight, what is the goal of lipid lowering? Well, you know my view on that. Uh, <coughs> If you go by the guidelines, okay, it's based on LDL primarily and risk factors, and then we have a goal. And so if the LDL is greater than 190 and you have uh, less than one or only one risk factor, the goal is less to get it to less than 160. And if it's greater than 160 and you have greater than one risk factor, then the goal is less than 130. Now, if you've had a heart attack, and if this is greater than 130, then you want to get it to less than 100. Well, my view is, if it is useful to get it to less than 100 after a heart attack, surely it must be useful to get it to less than 100 before a heart attack. So, I think this should be the goal for everybody. And if your LDL is 140, the chances are enormous that you're forming a plaque in your arteries. And you've got to decide, and I've got to decide, how many plaques we're willing to tolerate. Okay. Uh, is the goal for primary prevention and secondary prevention the same? My view it is. At least it should be. Uh, is the goal for decreasing the risk, decreasing risk the same as a goal for preventing or arresting 
the atherosclerotic process. Usually it's not. I think it should be. Number nine, should all patients who've had an atherosclerotic event be on one or more lipid-lowering agents, irrespective of the level of total and LDL cholesterol? Okay, you've got somebody who's had an acute myocardial infarction, their LDL is 95. Should you put them on staff? Well, I don't know if anybody really knows the answer. Uh, I would say yes. Uh, whatever the number is uh, in that patient, I think it's too high for that patient. I think these are also the patients uh, that you need to do the particle size, like the protein particle size, LP little a, T-reactive protein, homocysteine, and so on. Uh, but I think if you have an atherosclerotic event, be it in the coronaries, parotids, abdominal aortic aneurysm, claudication, statin is the drug to take off the shelf, among others. Okay, um, number 10, why should all patients with diabetes be on one or more lipid-lowering agents? We had a diabetologist talk to us uh, where I am recently. And this fellow, uh, uh, endocrinology, said uh, the most important drugs in this order for diabetes is a statin drug, uh, an ACE, uh, an aspirin, and an anti-glycemic agent. You agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, when you see a diabetic coming in the office, that person should be on a statin drug. Now, why? Uh, there are two reasons, I think. Number one, a beautiful study by Steve Hefner, and that is he took some patients with diabetes mellitus who had not had an acute myocardial infarction, and he followed them for seven years. And almost 20% of them had a first acute myocardial infarction in that seven years. And then he took another group of people who had an acute myocardial infarction which healed and they did not have diabetes and 20% of them had a second infarct within that seven year period. So it looked like the person with diabetes without an event had the same uh, also, uh, a morphologic study, if you take patients with diabetes uh, and compare them uh, who've never had a coronary event and compare them at autopsy to patients who've had an acute myocardial infarction <coughs> or a coronary or another type of coronary event, and these are without a coronary event, the amount of coronary narrowing, if you quantitate it, is roughly the same in each group. That's a very powerful uh, reason, I think. Uh, number 11, are the results of long-term outcome studies important when selecting a statin drug? Well, there are, there are three statin drugs that have long-term studies, and that's uh, lovastatin, simvastatin, and pravastatin. Uh, the others, some are in process at the moment. Uh, some have studies for 16 weeks. They're very good studies, very impressive. Uh, uh, I think Baycol catastrophe makes this a little more important. Baycol came out in 1997, I think. One of the other popular ones also came out in 1997. Uh, it took nearly four years to see that Baycol was a little different. Uh, as I understand it, if you look at uh, uh, fatal rhabdomyolysis, uh, Baycol had 41 patients who died from rhabdomyolysis among 700,000 so treated. Uh, Lipitor and simvastatin have about uh, 10, and one of them it's uh, of 15 million treated, and the other in 31 million treated. So quite a difference safety standpoint. Okay, 12. 
Should niacin and fibrates be used as monotherapy or should they be added to a statin drug? Is niacin safe in patients with diabetes? Well, my own view is, is that anybody with dyslipidemia ought to be on a statin drug. That's my view. I think niacin is an add-on drug. Wonderful combination. Niacin, it really is, has the most effect on changing particle size. It has by far the most effect in changing the small, dense LDL to large, buoyant LDL. Uh, it's the most powerful lore of, uh, of LP little a. Uh, Scott Grundy d has done a study recently that showed if, if your niacin dose is anywhere from uh, 500 to 1,500 in patients with diabetes mellitus, that the effect on management of the blood glucose and that therapy is, uh, is not very important. At a higher dose, it becomes important. Do you agree with that? Uh, okay, and then statin plus fibrate. Um, when those lipids, I mean, when the triglycerides are way up there, uh, this drug, uh, phenofibrate, gemfibrazil, uh, clearly is very beneficial. I had a trip to uh, Hong Kong a few months ago, and the most commonly sold drug, prescription drug in Hong Kong is Xenocal, all that stuff. 99% uh, of the buyers are women. If they get two pounds overweight, they take a Xenocal. Uh, we've got a paper in press right now uh, that shows the effect of Xenocal on patients with uh, triglyceride levels that are quite high, like 1,000 to 1,500. And, and it clearly uh, uh, has a substantial uh, effect in reducing uh, triglyceride levels. Okay. Is it important to lower triglyceride levels, and if so, by what means? Uh, everybody knows the most important is to lower LDL. The second most important is to raise HDL. And the third is to, is to lower triglycerides. Now, why? Uh, number one, when the triglyceride level is increased, the HDL tends to be decreased. And the LDL particle size tends to be small and dense rather than large and, and buoyant. Number two, Patients with increased triglyceride levels tend to be procoagulant. They're clotus. The platelets apparently stick together more than similar age patients with uh, lower triglyceride levels. Their fibrinogen levels are increased. Uh, their thrombolytic system uh, does not work as well. Uh, factor five, factor seven, I understand, is uh, increased. So there are some problems there. Number three, and probably most important, most patients with elevated triglyceride levels have the metabolic syndrome. And one of the things that uh, the National Cholesterol Education Guidelines, uh, ATP3 so-called, uh, emphasize the, the metabolic syndrome uh, very much. Well, what is it? These people tend to have elevated uh, triglyceride level. Um, and therefore, they have that what goes with it. Their HDL tends to be decreased, and their LDL tends to be small uh, and dense rather than large and buoyant. They're overweight, blood pressure's increased, their uh, blood sugar is increased, frequency of diabetes uh, is increased, uh, their blood insulin level is increased. This is America at its at its best or worst, right here. 60% uh, of Americans are overweight. The average American gained eight or nine pounds in the 1990s. And of that 60%, 30% are obese. Body mass index greater than 30. Major problem in the United States. Uh, number 14, what is meant by fixed pricing of certain statin drugs. Uh, Baycol had a fixed price when it came, was available of, I believe, uh, 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 with the same price. Uh, Simvastatin has the 20, the 40, 80 at the same price. So you can get the 80 for the same price as, uh, as 
20. Cut it. Buy that and get that twice. This is hard to cut, that's hard to cut. I don't think the others, no, no, uh, Provacol now, I believe, is get is fixed price, I think. Most studies on Provacol are 40 milligrams. Every study on Provacol is 40 milligrams. The most commonly do dose of Provacol in this country is 20. Uh, number 15, how important are the non-lipid effects of statin drugs? Um, <coughs> The so-called pleiotropic effects, probably very important. Uh, uh, they lower their anti-inflammatory, the CPR, CRP uh, levels can be decreased uh, by statin drugs. Uh, the endothelial secretions can change from vasoconstrictor to vasodilatory with these drugs. Um, they're apparently good for cognitive function. Alzheimer's disease is some early evidence that, that maybe that can be delayed or for a while or maybe it's even effective in people who have it. Uh, it may be good for bones. It may turn out to be good for osteoporosis. Uh, that, of course, is being uh, developed more and more. Number 16, do statin drugs decrease the frequency of stroke? The answer is yes. Uh, Meta-analysis by 30%. A 30% decrease in stroke. Dear God, don't let me have a stroke. Uh, the statins are the first drug to show a decreased frequency of stroke other than an antihypertensive agent. The HOPE trial showed that ACE inhibitors, uh, or at least uh, uh, Ramipril, decreased uh, stroke by about 25%. Number 17, is it mandatory to be on a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet when taking a statin drug? Um, the answer is no. Uh, the beautiful study by Hunting Hack, uh, they took patients in, who are on a 40% of calories from fat, and they decreased those percent of calories from fat to 30%. They did not add a statin, and they got a 5% reduction in LDL. Then they took patients 40% of calories. They kept them on 40% of calories from fat, but they added a statin drug. This was lobostatin, 20 milligrams, and they got a 27% reduction in LDL. And then they combined it. They took patients with a 40% of calories from fat, lowered them to 30%, added the lobostatin, 20 milligrams, and just added them up. They got. So, if you don't want to change your diet, you can't insist on it. They still get a huge benefit. Of course, these two work synergistically, so one plays on the other. Folks, thank you for your attention. It's been a pleasure to be here. I guess I'll use this microphone. I understand Dr. Roberts has a flight and uh, has to get through security, but I think we have time for a few questions. Yes, sir. I came through security yesterday. I never came through faster in my life. Went right through. Nobody's at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Would you comment on the toxicity of the combination of the and statin? Well, that's what Byrne Bay called. I think about, uh, uh, about a third of the patients who developed uh, rhabdomyolysis uh, with uh, cerubostatin were on combination with the uh, gem fibrosil. And uh, they didn't have a black box, but they had a warning on it uh, in their drug insert. And uh, despite that warning, that combination kept being given. Uh, now, there's some uh, people that believe that phenofibrate uh, combination with a statin may be a little safer than Gem 5%. I don't know the answer to that. So, 
whole. Anytime you combine two drugs, at least if you combine niacin with a statin and, uh, and a fibrate with a statin, it increases the frequency of liver enzyme elevation. Now, rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is only about one out of 10,000 people on mono. On combination, I'm not sure what it is. Maybe it's one in 5,000. It increases it a bit, but uh, you know that balance has to be taken into consideration. Now, the um, the sharing plow addition, this uh, uh, Zitavib, uh, which is a, a gastric cholesterol blocker, non-systemic. So they've got uh, simvastatin plus azitamide at 10 milligrams gives a LDL reduction of 52%. Now that's a very low dose here, and this is non-systemic. This will probably come out next year. If you raise that to 80 plus 10, you get a 65%. Yes? Can you uh, comment on the uh, reversal of atherosclerotic process with the statins, not just arresting or preventing the uh, progression, but actually reversal of uh, plaque size or something along those lines? Uh, can I comment? Uh, uh, yes, I can. Uh, will it mean anything? Probably not. Uh, uh, most of the reversal studies have used uh, angiography, of course, and they show just a tiny reduction. But I don't think that procedure is enough to, to, to know for sure. Uh, Steve uh, Nyson at the Cleveland Clinic uh, has a system now that he can uh, do intravascular ultrasonic imaging. Uh, I think he's doing it in the left anterior descending coronary artery for five centimeters. And they're putting these patients on statins, ACE inhibitors, and other kind of things, and just following them for several years. And, and the Intravascular ultrasonic images, of course, are cross-sectional area images. So, uh, you, you know, if you've got a lumen here, and then you've got five, two years later, you've got a lumen here, and they know where they are, uh, I think it'll be much easier to know that. Uh, one problem, however, is that I, I think we can't count on reversibility too much. And the reason for that is when I was at NIH, we did a lot of quantitative studies on, on coronary narrowings in various fatal atherosclerotic events. And it turns out that if you look at these plaques, uh, about uh, fibrous tissue is about 75% of plaques in patients with fatal coronary events. A lipid is about 10%, and calcium is approximately 10%. Uh, now, it's unlikely, I think, that calcium is reversible. There's some debate there, but I think it's unlikely. I think it's a little unlikely that fibrous tissue is reversible, although Robert Whistle in Chicago believes that may not entirely be the case. So what we're talking about is this. And the quantity of lipid in plaques in people with events, by that time, it's relatively small. Fibrous tissue is by far and away uh, the dominant component. I was somewhat concerned about uh, the most recent American Heart Association statement about hormone replacement therapy. Uh, there was sort of a there has been sort of a reversal, and, and even though it was a little bit vague how it was supposed to come out, it implied that there was no benefit whatsoever. Do you want to comment on that? That's sort of away from the statins, but it, it's part of uh, what people are trying to decide what to do with hormones, uh, especially after menopause, in the role of prevention of heart disease. Well, you're obviously a far more expert than I am uh, on that. I, I think these studies are are very disappointing. Uh, the the uh, HER trial, for example, 
um, in, in preventing cardiovascular disease. But there are other reasons that, again, you know far better than I do for giving um, hormonal replacement therapy. It's still, it seems still uh, to me, if you don't have a uterus, or if, you're all, if you've been on the drug, or been on hormone replacement for a couple of years, after a couple of years, there was benefit. First two years, that's when the problems occurred. I don't know. I think it's a hazy area. What, what is your view? I guess, you know, what the Hearst uh, study suggested is that there was no obvious benefit for secondary prevention in people who had known heart disease. But there's an awful lot of observational data uh, looking at prevention of vascular disease in women who are on hormone replacement therapy. And it's, it sounded like the American Heart Association came out too globally, implying there was no role whatsoever. And so I, I guess I agree with you. I think it's still maybe a little bit muddy, uh, but it's muddy enough that perhaps there shouldn't be a global statement saying that there's no role at all. And I think because of that, there are many people are saying go off your hormone replacement therapy or do not consider it at all for prevention of heart disease. And, and I guess that's my, my concern, is that perhaps it, it got overstepped a little bit too far, that perhaps we can't say that it prevents secondary uh, events after you have known heart disease, but I, I think that there is some benefit or evidence of benefit in a variety of different studies that there may be prevention if started before you have your first event. Yes, sir. Your goal is prevention. Uh, so how young And arresting. And arresting. Process and getting LDLs below 100 for, for everybody. How young should we be screening our patients for this? Should we be looking at this routinely in all of our 20-year-olds? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I think that if you, the importance of identifying that one out of 500 per people with a familial variety uh, is number one, they need to be on a statin drug, period maybe other things too. No matter whether they're pure vegetarians or what, it's not going to be enough just by diet. Now, uh, so I think it's useful in, if you identify the adults here to screen those youngsters. Uh, the, as you know, with uh, boys, if, you, if this is 20 and this is, uh, let's say, LDL, LDL is about 100 uh, in girls, starts going up, I think, about 20 or so. In boys, it's about 14. Right at puberty, it starts going up. Well, I, I think we all ought to know what our cholesterols are by 20, myself. And if, if, you know, today, type 2 diabetes is in 14 year olds. These kids are but growing up on the hamburgers and hot dogs. Uh, you know, I say, you know, appropriate to talk about cows in Omaha, Nebraska, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> you know, in this country, we have 281 million, 282 million people, and we have 100 million cows. <laughs> and every day, we kill 100,000 of them. Uh, you know, 1,100 pounds hanging up there. And uh, if you eat a cow in this country, you get a lot of fat in there. You know, we bring them into these feed lots and feed them 20, 25 pounds of grain and soybean every day. Why do we do that? We do that to make them fat, to marble them. And then the Department of Agriculture gives them a better grain and they taste better. And then we kill them and then they kill us. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way the system works. And, and we also kill about 300,000 uh, pigs. And if you're a chicken, folks, don't wander into the USA. We, we kill anywhere from 15 to 20 million chickens every day. And we wonder why we have so much atherosclerosis. Well, I, I think it's going to be difficult to top that. Thank you, Dr. Roberts.